Hello everyone, I'm Kathy Kellenberger and I am the co-leader of the Women in Technology chapter. Re Irish is the other co-leader and um, she usually does these but today I'm doing uh, the hosting for you. And um, what I'd like to do is invite you to join our chapter, check out our YouTube channel and you know, be sure to join us because we have a monthly newsletter that goes out with lots of uh, news about what's going on with our chapter, as well as we promote women in our community, uh, whether they're speaking at different events, and we also want to start promoting women bloggers as well. Next month, we have a session on deadlocking and blocking from Amy Harold. And in March, we are going to have at least three sessions, uh, one with Kaylin Delaney, one with Heather Ritchie. And Heather Ritchie is the speaker we had at the Women in Technology Luncheon at Past Summit. So I'm really, really excited about that. In April, we have a session on DevOps 101. And that's a really important topic as we try to, try to uh, mature our technologies and mature our our uh, agile processes in our companies. We have a lot of women speaking at SQL Saturdays coming up. In Cleveland, there are quite a few women. I'm not going to go through this whole list. We'll never get done. Guatemala and Redmond, and those are just a few. The list goes on and on. So be sure to check out either our newsletter or our website to find out where more women are speaking so you can get out there and support them. Because Redgate is one of our sponsors, uh, one of their benefits is being able to have a, a short uh, kind of little commercial or ad. So I'm going to be doing that today for Redgate. And I'm going to just show you our monitor product. Oh, and by the way, I do work for Redgate, in case you're wondering why I'm doing this. Um, so today's topic is about being that lone DBA or being on a really small team where you may or may not um, have a chance, uh, you know, to, to monitor the SQL servers and take care of them um, as, as you would really like to. So Redgate has this nice tool called SQL Monitor, and you can go out and play with this for yourself. Um, at monitor-redgate.com, and this, these are actually monitoring real SQL servers uh, at Redgate. These are not demo servers. So if I click on one of these, I can see more information about what's going on at any given time period. So if I see, ah, let me just turn some of these off. I think this one's a dev machine. Um, I'm looking at weight. So what I can do is drag this little icon over to that peak, and underneath, everything will change to that particular time period so that I can see what's going on. And I don't want to spend a ton of time with this because I want to make sure that, that Monica, our speaker, has plenty of time. But I wanted to show you a couple of my favorite things. So when I scroll down, I see the top queries down here. And um, I noticed this query uh, ran once, but it took quite a bit of time to run. We had three logical reads, so I wonder what's going on with that one. I can sort this by either the count or the logical reads, for example. So this one right here um, has a lot of logical reads. And whenever I click on it, I can take a look at the query plan. I can take a look at the text. And I believe, yeah, it also tells me uh, the weight type, SOS scheduler yield. So it tells me that this one's um, something with CPU going on with that. The other thing I really love here is I can click on top 10 weights. And uh, for any particular weight, let's click on this one, it tells me how much that weight um, was, uh, you know, came up in the system and also which queries were affected by it. So I don't want to spend any more time going over that, but I just wanted to invite you to, to come out to monitor 
red-gate.com and try it for yourself if you're in the market for a monitoring tool. So today's session, we are honored to have Monica Rathman present for it for us. I'm it, Survival Techniques for the Loan DBA. And um, I've been there. I've been that loan DBA, the first DBA at a company before. And uh, there's a lot, lot to do. So she's going to show us some of the things that you can do to make your job easier. Uh, she's a consultant for Denny Cherry & Associates. She lives in Virginia. She's also a Microsoft MVP for the data platform. Congratulations, Monica, on that. She was a loan DBA for 16 years. She's worked with SQL Server and Oracle, and now she's a consultant. So all that stuff that she's learned, she's sharing with everyone else and helping a lot of other companies who are, are in the same boat that she was. She speaks at SQL Saturdays. Um, she's a leader of the Hampton Roads SQL Server user group and a Mid-Atlantic past regional director, a regional mentor. And she was is also an IDERA ace, an IDERA super, superstar, and Century One PAC member. She's very passionate about SQL Server and SQL Family, and she loves to get back to the community. And she can be found on Twitter at SQL Expresso. So what I'm going to do at this point is I am going to unmute her and make her the presenter. Hey, hey figure out how to make you the presenter. And, um, oh, one more thing before we get started. If you have questions, please put them in the little question box, and I will read them to Monica as they come up. And I'm going to make myself mute at this point, and I can see your screen, so it looks like you're ready to go. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Um, this is my first time giving this uh, session virtually, so... Hopefully, you know, it'll go well. I won't talk too fast for you, which I'm notorious for. Um, if you have any questions, please chime in. Um, like she said, I am a, currently a consultant for Denny Cherry & Associates. Um, I'm a past uh, regional mentor, and I run my local user group. I am on Twitter daily, so you, I am easily accessible to you if you have any questions following this uh, presentation. My presentation rules, I really like to make this a one-on-one -on -one conversation with everybody. It's a two-way street. The only way we can actually make each other better is to share our experiences. So I have no problems if you interrupt and have a question as I'm going through my slides. I'll be happy to stop what I'm doing and uh, discuss that. What we're going to go over today is I'm it, doing the job of many. Um, how do you do everything as one person? Um, being a master of none, which is very, very hard for a type A type personality um, that I have. Uh, how to use outside resources. How can you actually use the people out there to help you get your job done? Getting a second set of eyes. You always need somebody to be able to review your code, somebody to bounce ideas off of. How do you get those when you're a lone DBA sitting in office by yourself? Managing the company's expectations. When you're one person, they can't expect you to do a job of 10 or 15 or even three or four. How are you able to do that and be able to tell the company, hey, I'm one person. I'm doing the best that I can and, and manage that. Um, life balance struggles. I have two girls. Everybody knows I'm a dance mom. I have a very, very busy schedule. How am I able to be on call 24-7? and still be able to maintain that life balance and give my girls the time that they need. Admitting that you can't do anything or can't do everything, um, that's really hard. Again, I'm a type A personality. I don't like to say I can't do something, but there are times where you're going to have to admit that and actually shift that work over to maybe some consultants or something like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about monkey instructions. That's my hit by the bus handbook that I talk about a lot. It's actually giving written documentation and ABC instructions to where somebody can pick up and do a little bit of the work that you need to have done if you're not in the office. Documenting your code. Hopefully everybody's already documenting their code. Um, it's very important not only to be able to hand that code off to somebody else to pick up after you if they need to, but to leave little breadcrumbs for yourself um, to where you can get back and figure out why you did something. Um, we're going to talk about avoiding customizations. Sure, you can write 
the cool things, but why take your time, which is essential in doing other things, to uh, create something that somebody else might have already done. Um, be an octopus. Again, you're one person having to do the job of many. How do you grow those eight arms that you need to accomplish all of that work? And then we'll talk about why I think it's not so bad. Why I was a lone DBA for 16 years and absolutely loved it. Um, I know some people, you know, find it overwhelming, but we're gonna we're gonna get through this and talk about why I loved it so much. And then I'm gonna give you my favorite part, which is homework. Yes, I actually assign homework, and it makes me really giddy when people do it. So um, hopefully you guys will as well. So I'm it. I was a loan DBA for 16 years. Um, my environments, I worked at the Port of Virginia uh, for 12 of those years. I managed by myself 56 SQL Server instances. That was 40 servers and unfortunately two Oracle servers. Then I moved over to a coffee company um, and worked for them for five years. I had 16 instances. Um, a lot less, which was great, 15 servers, and I still got stuck with one Oracle server. I wasn't able to get away from that, unfortunately. But what was interesting is as a lone DBA, when I worked for the port, they became so reliant on me that when I gave them my notice, the proverbial, uh, you know, crap hit the fan kind of thing happened, uh, they kind of freaked out because I was the only one in their environment that knew anything about SQL Server. I did everything associated with any kind of SQL Server products, including development. So when I said I was leaving, they really did freak out. Um, they offered me whatever they could to get me to stay on board. I was just ready to move on. Um, so what they ended up doing, and unfortunately companies should not put themselves in this situation, is I worked for the Port of Virginia and Massimo Zanetti for two years. I was full time with both companies uh, for two years. At night, I would work for the Port of Virginia just to keep them afloat. I was passing on information to everybody that I could to, uh, to help them maintain and keep their servers up and running. But that was two years of my life where I had double work and overwhelmed and had to do like major balancing. That was really, really great for my pocketbook, I won't lie. But for work-life balance, it was tough. So it's important to make sure you're sharing the information and you're able to leave a company when you're ready to leave a company and be able to pass that information over. Otherwise, you will get stuck in a situation where I was uh, for the two years when I was transitioning between companies. So my knowledge base. Um, I know everything but the kitchen sink is what I say. Um, I'm not an expert in anything. I do have uh, the really great benefit of being able to have dabbled in a ton of stuff. You know, I'm doing all the regular database stuff. I do all your backups and your design and SSIS and reporting services, tabular services, um, SSIS, I'm sorry, SSIS and multidimensional Power BI, application development, audits, change audits, every single thing I've touched um, as far as I'm concerned of SQL Server as much as I can. But I am never going to be an expert in anything. Um, but what's really good about that, because I'm the only loan TBA and I'm the only person touching SQL Server, is it really does make you marketable. Um, because I've had the opportunity to touch so many things, um, that's one of the benefits of being that loan DBA for so long. So how did I do it? What's kind of crazy is I actually got the job at the Port of Virginia straight out of college. I had zero DBA experience. I had a piece of paper with a information technology degree, and I was given the job of DBA with zero database knowledge. The port was crazy, but hey, it worked to my benefit. I uh, actually went and uh, took a six-week course um, on SQL Server, and I got my certification. It was in 2005, a long time ago. Um, and then I was handed over all those servers, and they said, keep them up and running, they're now yours. Well, I was young. I had to be able to figure out how to do all of this stuff. So what you have to do is you have to build your skill set. You know, you have to become that master of none and learn as much about SQL Server as possible, and that's what I needed to do to be able to start that job and get things moving um, on that at the port. So how did I build my skill set? Um, Self-taught. You got to have that passion. You got to have the ability to go out there and learn stuff on your own. Um, where do you go to do that? Virtual conferences. I actually used swug.org. 
when I was a fledgling and started out. Uh, I would do their three-day virtual conferences um, because my work did not have a budget for any more training. After that six weeks, I had to find other avenues. So I would lock myself in my office for the three days and do their, uh, their training as much as I could. I would go and check out virtual user groups and learn and watch sessions as I could during my lunch breaks. Um, I discovered the really good thing about SQL Saturdays and started to go to SQL Saturdays and learn those sessions on my own time, watch everything that I needed to learn. If I was doing some stuff on cubes, I would make sure I would go and do some sessions um, to try to learn some things on cubes. And then the best thing I did was to attend a past summit. I was able to go there and get immersed in, um, in SQL Server and people that were like-minded and make some really great connections that have helped me over my career and helped me as a lone DBA to be able to do my job. So that's how I started out. Luckily, I have that passion for self-learning, uh, which I think is extremely important if you're a lone DBA or if you're in a small group. You have to go out there and teach. No one's there to mentor you and hand you the information. You've got to go and do it. One of the things that I learned while doing that is I can only learn what I need. I needed to learn what I needed to know to get a project accomplished. I couldn't, again, master anything. When I had to learn tabular modeling, I had to go and learn how to do step-by-step -step and play around with it. I couldn't go and be an expert to be able to answer everybody's questions on tabular, tabular uh, cubes right away. I had to actually go and do it step-by-step -step and only learn what I needed and move on. Like I said, being a master of anything is impossible. Um, I'm never again going to be, you know, your go-to expert. You know, I've got to learn that, to accept that I'm not going to know everything. But I'm going to know a little bit about all of it. And I'm going to be able to steer somebody in a direction um, to get them the information that they need. But I'm not going to be the one that's going to write a white paper on anything. Um, and I've got to be okay with that. And that can be a struggle for some people. Hey, Monica, I have a yeah. question for you. Um, Great. Did you mention that you got certified, got a, a SQL certification? And if so, uh, which one was that? It was in 2005, SQL Server 2005. I can't remember what they called it now. It had a different name at the time. Okay. Um, and to be honest, I haven't upped my certification since then. It's probably something I need to do, um, but I haven't actually done it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so this is my favorite slide, and I think this is the most important thing to walk around or walk away from with this. Um, it's how to use outside resources. When you are a lone DBA in an office, a beginner, a fledgling like I call it, or an expert, you're sitting in an office working on problems. You're looking at your own code. You're trying to figure out things that you may have done wrong, or you're trying to figure out a problem that you've never seen before, and you have nobody to bounce ideas off of. Working at the port and working at the coffee company, it was just me. I was the only one with SQL knowledge. Doing a job where you're just the only person, you've got to be able to find out, find other resources, other people to communicate with that have shared knowledge, somebody that you can actually bounce ideas off of. So the power of Twitter, if you're not on Twitter already, I highly recommend it. Um, Twitter is a great resource. We have, you end up being one DBA that the company hired with thousands of virtual coworkers. Everybody out there on Twitter is there working with you side by side to help you get your job done. There's nothing more powerful than that. Um, you can get out there and use what we have uh, as the SQL help hashtag. This was started a long time ago and people can actually go and put questions out on Twitter and get answers immediately from people to help you solve production type issues. I recall, and I mentioned this quite a few times as I do this session, is we had a SharePoint upgrade at one of the places that I worked. I know a little bit about SharePoint. I know the database back end, um, but I'm not an expert in it. And our, our SharePoint admin decided that they were going to do an upgrade. They were going to upgrade from 2007 to 2010. Well, they didn't let me know an upgrade was happening, and they didn't have me do a SQL backup right away for them to be able to uh, restore if they had any problems. Um, we just had our normal backups. And then they decided as their rollback solution to do a snapshot, a VM snapshot. So the story moves on that 11 o'clock on a Friday night, after I've had a little, you know, 
fun. Um, they call me and say, hey, oh, I must preface this with, we had reporting services in SharePoint integrated mode, which meant all of our reports that ran production um, machines and things like that were actually in SharePoint. Okay, moving forward. What happened was I get a call, it was about 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night saying, oh my God, we have lost everything. All of our reports are gone. All of our connections are gone. Um, we've had to roll back. The upgrade did not work. And then the rollback did not work. Please help us restore all of these reports and get things running before 7 a.m. tomorrow morning when our production lines need these values. And I'm like, oh, crap. You know, I don't know what, what you guys did. I'm not sure how to piecemeal this together. Let me dive in and see what I can do. Well, luckily for me, I was able to turn to Twitter, and I actually went out there and said, hey, we've lost everything inside SharePoint. It's SSRS integrated mode. I need to get these reports back. How do I go and rebuild um, the database to make this work? Um, and luckily for me, even though it was 11 o'clock at night, there's 24 hours support out there on Twitter. Everybody's working around the world. So I had several people jump in, help me for an hour or two, get everything up and running. And we were actually able to get all those reports in hand to uh, everybody um, before the deadline, which was fantastic. I would have never been able to pull that off and rebuild everything um, and actually get it to work without the help of those on Twitter. So I'm very, very grateful with that option out there. And I hope everybody actually goes out there and uses these uh, social resources that we have out there. If you're not a Twitter fan, we also have Slack. The same community is out there on Slack. So join us. Um, let them help you. It's very important to use those outside resources. And if you're not using that, blogs. I hope everybody is actually reading blogs. I make it a point every day to read at least two blogs, and I have for a really long time. It helps me not only build my skill set, um, but it lets me get introduced to new things that I might not have known about or new ways of looking at things. These are the, some of the ones that I use. Of course, any Cherry and Associates, that's what I write for. And then we have SQL Skills. SQL Skills has a fantastic um, blog site that, uh, that can get you a lot of information. Um, SQLblog.com is a great one. And then Thomas LaRock actually has one where he actually ranks um, certain blogs out there. So if you have no idea what to read, these are great ways to start. Um, one other thing about Twitter is a lot of people out there will actually do a post that says currently reading and give you a link to somebody's blog post. I really pay attention to those. I click on those links. If it's worth them reading, maybe it's worth me reading. So if you're blind and not sure how to navigate through what blogs to read or what kind of things to do, they give you a direction. Click on the links. If they're reading it, maybe you should. Resources. Use Google. Google the crap out of things, um, but don't blindly trust it. There's a lot of really great information out there. But I find that a lot of people just go grab some code and run it into their production environment and expect it to work or expect it not to cause issues. Make sure you're doing your due diligence, but Google the heck out of it. You know, there's answers out there. There's reasons why people blog. There's reasons why people are using different forums out there to share the problems that we've all had. Use these outside resources people are, using, are putting out there for you. Again, SQL Server Central is a great one, DB, uh, DBA Stack Exchange, and SQL Tips. If you're not using them already, I, I advise you to check them out. Getting a second set of eyes. This is a big one. Um, this is where networking is so important, and Twitter, and making communications with other people, um, connections with other people that are in our community. Um, again, I'm not an expert. I'll never be your expert. However, I'm going to have several go-to experts in my pocket. I'm going to make it part of my networking strategy to find somebody that's an expert in internals. I'm going to find somebody that's expert in storage, in PowerShell, in disaster recovery. I'm going to go to those go-to people when I have a question and ask them for their input. Because again, I don't have the time to become an expert in something. But having the ability to contact somebody who is an expert is really important. So when you're going to events like SQL Saturdays or your local user group, or if you're lucky enough to go to Pass Summit, 
make sure you kind of have a list to yourself that says, hey, I'm going to be learning PowerShell. Let me go and track down a PowerShell expert and friend them. You know, you want to actually start conversations with them, get contact information. Having these kind of experts in your back pocket makes a huge difference, not only as a loan DBA, but any DBA out there. Um, having these consultants, you know, available to you when you have questions. Um, code reviewers. I think my code is horrible but I'm going to write it and I'm going to get it done and it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It would be great if I could kick that code to somebody and have them help me, you know, look through it, see how I can do it better. I can learn more. Um, I have people in my pocket that I can do that with. Uh, brainstorming. I am really, really lucky that over the time I've actually made some really great friends who are experts in things. And I have a hangout group that I'm on every day who, has an, who are experts. And we sit and talk all day long and shoot questions back and forth and things like that. Having those type of avenues and creating those networked relationships make a huge difference, not only in your career, but getting your work done. Um, again, you're not an expert. You need to find people that are. Managing your Monica. company's expectations. Yes, ma'am. I have some questions for you. Okay. Um, someone said they did not catch which three-day conference that you attended. And I didn't catch this. This was like 10 minutes ago, so I have to think. No about. problem. That was SWUG, S-S-W-U-G dot com. It's, um, they do virtual conferences twice a year, um, at least when I was taking them. And I could actually, I think it was like two or $300 at the time. And I could actually watch them at work um, and just close my door and, and watch the conference. And that's how I learned, because I wasn't able to travel and go to any conferences. Okay. And how do you know if you are using best practices if you don't know a lot of depth about the topic? Exactly. That's one of the problems of being a lone DBA, right? You just don't know this stuff. You actually have to go out and find the outside resources that kind of um, help you and guide you. And again, making those go-to experts, right, to where you can shoot somebody or ask questions, you know, kick them some questions. Um, things like that, you don't know, you're blind, you're walking around, you know, touching and feeling and hoping that, that you've hit the mark. Um, that's, that's the case with a lot of us, whether you're an expert or not. So the key is, is making sure you have the outside resources and you're taking the self-initiative to learn. It's, it's the best thing you can do. There's no rhyme or reason to it. You just have to go out there and learn. Okay, got one more. This is not really okay. a question, but I, I second this comment. Um, only this far into the webinar, and she is awesome. So much guidance <laughs> and info. I love it. So I second that comment. So I'm going to go ahead and let you continue. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So managing the company's expectations. Lord knows they're going to shoot as much work to you as you can get done, right? And you want to be able to live up those to those expectations. You want to be the star. You want to be the the expert in SQL Server in your realm at your work, right? But the problem is, the better you are, the more they take advantage of you, right? We all have been there. They're gonna, you've got a ton of work done last week, so they're going to give you more this week and more on top of that. You've got to be able to manage your workload. You've got to make sure they don't burn you out, which is really hard to do. You've got to get them to train you and give you tools. You can't do everything manually by yourself. You just can't. You've got to have some automated tools. And I'll go into that later in the slide deck of different ones I've used to be able to give me my eight octopus arms to get things done. Um, but if they want you to do the job of many, you've got, to, you've got to get them to train you to do that. They're going to have to put out a little bit of money. They're going to have to give you some tools to do that. It's cheaper than hiring another DBA. Um, and you've got to be able to tell them no. How am I able to tell them no is my key to success here is using your boss as a shield. You've got to be able to not be the yes man. But you also have to be able to not be the grumpy DBA that always says no. Or when somebody walks into your room with what I call drive-bys, you know, you've got that VIP that walks in or that vice president that walks in and says, hey, I've got this report. I need this column moved to that column, and I need it in the next, you know, 20 minutes, and it's so important, and you've got to stop what you're doing and just do it. Well, you can't really tell the VP no, 
but you can see, okay, let me let me uh, see what you need, or uh, I'll get back to you very shortly, or something like that. And then go and communicate with your boss somehow, some way, and let them know, hey, I've got these priorities. This is what needs to get done. I have this VP that just walked in. How do you want me to handle this or whatever? And let them go and communicate to that VP. That VP, they can go and say, hey, I know this is important to you. We're going to squeeze it in as much as possible, but she needs to do X, Y, Z first. You know, using the boss as a shield also gets you from having to work on too many projects at one time. She's the one or he's the one to be able to say her priorities are this. And that way you're not the one controlling um, the workload coming to you. You're really using the boss to manage that. And I think that's important. Uh, one of the other things I do is I have a whiteboard in my office, always did. And I put on there my priority list in big black lettering on the whiteboard. So anybody who can walk in can see what projects I'm working on. And so they can see, yes, they're prioritized on my board, or they can see, man, she's busy. Maybe I should wait and give this to somebody else, or hold off or see what I can do um, as another means of getting it done. I visually give them um, the look of how busy I am, because there's some weeks where I might have 70, 80 things to do, and there's no lie. And then there's other weeks, maybe I'm just working on a project, and it's really one thing to do. They don't know that. They don't know everything that's going on with the production databases. So I really try to make sure I'm communicating with my boss and she knows what's going on or he knows what's going on and she's the one or he's the one shielding me um, from the extra workloading coming through. Developing that relationship with that boss and actually having that conversation. Hey, I really need to use you as a shield. We need to have this type of relationship. Um, it's really important. It really has helped me over the years, um, especially when it comes to those drive-bys that I know we all experience. Monica. Yes. Got a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, getting to this late, can you talk about how you use GoToMeeting or similar products with your crew and how you meet regularly? And how did you pick your crew? And I'm not sure exactly crew means coworkers or crew means, I guess, people. I'm not sure. I think, I think they're talking about what I said with my Hangouts. I have a daily Hangout session. Mm -hmm. um, where I have a bunch of experts um, that we talk all day long and we send questions back and forth. And I don't really pick, I didn't really pick my crew. It's just when you're networking and you go to events and you start talking to people and build relationships. Um, these people have kind of become my family and I'm just really lucky um, that they happen to be internals experts and storage experts. And um, I have Re, which is a master of everything. Um, so I have... I have several people just that I've met um, and made connections with, and I've just gotten really lucky. So as, like I said, for example, when you're going and doing networking, it's all about, you know, finding people that you have commonalities with or that you strike up a conversation about your passion for PowerShell. And then maybe hit them up and say, hey, you know, maybe we can, we have a Slack channel that we're both in that we can talk or we can DM each other questions. It's all about getting out there and just making the connections and, and working with them. And that's just what the nine of us have done um, over the years. And I'm just lucky in that case. Cool. Um, what do you do if your boss is bad at being a shield and managing your network? <laughs> I've had one of those. Um, all you can do is, is keep trying. I really don't like when you're a lone DBA and you start to get disgruntled and you start to be the no say naysayer. Um, all you can do is kind of build up your own shell, your own shield for yourself and um, just try not to say no. You just go and say, let me look into that. Let me see what I can do. Um, I'll get back to you. Using words that are not an affirmation as far as yes, I'm going to do that for you is the best thing you can do. Okay. Because then you can go back and look and maybe in writing or an email saying, hey, this was your request. I can give you this timetable to get it done. And you become your own shield. Um, but it's really important not to be the negative right. DBA. From your experience, what is the reasonable time for a newly hired person to get used to an environment? Ooh, depends how motivated the person is. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would hope in the first three months you're able to navigate through everything and um, you've gotten your feel. 
uh, I would expect in the six month realm, I should be able to ask you questions. And within nine months, you shouldn't have to go to anybody else in the office to figure things out. You should know where to go and then be able to uh, use your own resources to get the task done. That's my opinion. Okay, um, thanks. Okay, so back to life balance struggles. Um, again, I have two girls, I'm a single mom. Um, way my morning used to work is, you know, you're on call 24 seven. Um, I'm a very, again, type A proactive, um, when something happens, I want to get it fixed right away before it tumbles into something worse. So my mornings would actually start off with me rolling over, shutting off my alarm, and checking my phone. I would immediately grab my phone, looking for alerts, looking for anything that I need to tackle before I got up and ready for work. If there was something that didn't run, a job or something failed, I would take my laptop, put it on the bathroom sink, and in between showering and brush my teeth, I was working. Um, I would get my girls ready, and you're always on call. When I w had something um, to do, I, my laptop was with me all the time. Um, vacation? <laughs> what was that? I never got to take a vacation until, lucky for me, my boss let me hire Re Irish, and she actually worked for me, uh, worked with me at the Port of Virginia for three months, and I was able to actually take a vacation for once. Um, but that was it. In all the 16 years, I had one vacation I was able to take and not have to work. Um, you have to plan your vacations. You have to work around the month end schedules. You have to work around year end. You have to work around audits. You have to work around upgrades. Um, vacation is very, very difficult. You're always on call. Um, how do you handle that? One is making sure your boss is aware of your time. Now, the important key to this is making sure that you're not whining about it or complaining about it or being very boisterous about all the time that you're putting on the books. Put it in there under the covers, you know. When you're replying to an email or a failure or updating a help desk ticket or something like that and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, copy your boss on it. They're going to notice that 2 a.m. timestamp. They're going to notice when you logged in on the weekend and you sent an email at 10 o'clock in the morning and then you had another email at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and then another email at 10 o'clock p.m. They're going to see that you worked all day without you having to tell them you worked all day. The company is getting hours from you that they're not even knowing, um, so they should be able to be flexible with you. You can ask for flex time. My stance, and I would have to actually get off of work at 3.30 every day. I wasn't in the office for 32 hours. I left at 3.30. But what was great about it is, one, I was able to take my laptop and work at the dance studio in my car, and I would work, you know, wherever I needed to be. But my boss knew, even though I was leaving at 3.30 in the afternoon and they only put in 32 hours in the office, they got a lot more time from me that I didn't have to be visually present in the office. So asking for flex time gives you the life balance struggle uh, flexibility. You know, it helps you work through that. Um, asking to work remotely. You know, when you're working on the weekends and you're working nights and stuff, there should be no reason why you can't go to them and say, hey, I've got a lot of work to do. I think it's best if I work remotely. I just kind of need to regather myself or work outside to where I'm not getting drive-bys um, to get things done. You know, remind them, you know, well, actually, you really don't need to remind them that you're doing all this extra work outside and they should honor your flexibility um, because you've, you've slid it in and made them aware. I've never had an evaluation in my 16 years that somebody didn't have on there at the end of the year always available, works above and beyond, gives more time than, than we could ever ask for, that kind of thing. Um, because I don't complain about it and you just do your job because you need to get it done. So I use that to my advantage and I work it to where I can get the flex time. I can take my girls to dance. I can do the dance conventions on the weekend. And um, it's just important, you know, you kind of let them know without whining about it. Admit you can't do everything. Yep. Um, hire I've consultants. Got a, I've got a question for you, Monica. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, as a lone DBA, I'm lumped in with a DevOps team at my work. How do you handle your team not understanding your priorities when planning sprints and workload? <laughs> That's common whether you're working with DevOps or anything. Nobody understands your workload. Um, all you can do, again, is make sure they see visually that they're important and they're part of your list. Um, let them know that, hey, I know 
this you need you're waiting on me to get something done I know it's a priority for you to be able to finish something you're on my list I'm getting it done I will get back to you what in the meantime can I do to give you a little bit that helps you move forward you know always feeding into I know you're important um, and what you need to get done relies on me I have that understanding I find that if they know if they know that you understand that um, it helps and again, visually showing everything that's on your plate. If it's bogging down your calendar with a million tasks that you have to do or putting it up on a whiteboard, if they see it, it makes a difference. Okay. Um, I think this next one is more of a comment. comment um, to buttress making sure your boss is aware of your time, I used to take work in my stride without copying my boss, and I got burnt out. What I learned to do is check in with my boss at regular intervals, get my boss in my corner, just like Monica suggests, especially for drive-bys and work with him to assign priorities. Exactly. Yeah. And then one more. Um, sorry to say, I guess this is about, uh, about some of the things that you did, but sorry to say this, is, this doesn't work with a family. I'm sure the girls aren't too happy with this always-on thing. So yes, we've had those conversations. I've had a lot of, mommy, you work too much, or can we leave your laptop at home, or you have your phone. Um, but you know what? Uh, I do and did put the phone down and make sure they got one-on-one -on -one time. I, again, am a single mom, so I still get the 100 million things done, and they are my priority. However, with good time management skills and taking advantage of of the little time that you have again while I'm waiting for them at dance I'm working in the car while they're doing something and busy I'm doing something um, it can work it does uh, it's just a matter of you keeping a positive attitude about it I think I think a lot of people just get um, disgruntled and overworked and again I think that goes back to managing um, your your job's expectations. If you can get that um, expectation level not to feel like such a burden, it doesn't come home to your family in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, I think my kids look up to me um, about the hard work that I do and being the provider and stuff. So, And I've heard that feedback from them in different ways. So I think it, it definitely can work with a Okay, thanks. So that's just my two cents. Cool. Okay, any more questions? That's all for right now. Okay, great. So admit that you can't do anything, uh, do everything. Um, when I worked at the port, hiring consultants was a big, oh my God, they're gonna steal my job. No, no, it, it scared everybody. The word consultant was taboo. Um, for me, I think hiring consultants is the best thing I did. It freed up my plate, able to do what I wanted to do. I was able to give away tedious work that I got tired of doing, and I was able to give them sometimes the big projects that I didn't have time for. The way to use consultants in this is, is when you have something like a big project that you really, really, really are excited about and you want to work on, sometimes you just can't do it, or you just can't give it your all because you have the day-to-day -day work that needs to get done, or you have other projects that need to do. Sometimes bringing in a consultant just for six weeks or just having a few hours on the books every month is a huge time saver for you to be able to get other things done. It's gonna make you more productive. Yes, I've built, I don't know, hundreds of servers. Maybe we are creating a new farm or doing something. Maybe I can kick that off to consultants so I can work on this new cube that they want developed. Or I can implement Power BI that I really want to do. Um, I can use that second set of hands sometimes. Um, so bringing in a consultant every once in a while, it also um, lets them double check me. Again, I'm only one person, like somebody said, with the best practices. Sometimes I don't know that I've got the right best practices. I've Googled something and I think I'm right, but it's always good to have somebody just double check you and look over things. It doesn't mean you haven't done the work well. It doesn't mean you can't do the work. It means you're working smarter and you're making sure your environment is the best that it can be. Remember, your in-house knowledge is your safety net. So many people when I worked at the port said, oh no, consultants are gonna take over my job. No. You have years and years and years of knowledge inside this company 
of how they do the financials, why reports are the way that they are, why a store procedure does what it is. That is your safety net. Don't let that scare you. Now, some of the things about bringing in a consultant that I've ran in over the years is gotchas. You know, sometimes you're giving up the stuff that you love to do. For me, and I always laugh about this, I think there's nothing sexier than setting up a brand new SQL server where everything's named exactly how you want it, all the best practices are implemented and stuff like that. It's kind of cathartic. It's kind of just like, ah, uh, zenful when you can see it. Well, I've done it a million times. Maybe I should kick that over to a consultant and let them do something. Or I love building cubes, but I really don't have time to devote myself to that project right now. Let me kick it over. And hand-holding consultants, what a pain in the butt. You know, you've got to help them with 20 million questions. You've got to stop what you're doing. You've got to go and research something and hand things over. You've got backups you have to do to shift over to them. However, they're doing 34 work for you, and you are hand-holding for three of those hours. That gives you that other amount of time to get things done that, one, you want to do, or two, you have to do. So again, admitting that you can't do everything and bringing out in outside help sometimes, if you're able to do it, do it by all means. Um, it's really helped with me. Monkey instructions, so important. Everybody needs a hit-by-the-bus handbook. You need a paper, again, like I said, paper copy of step-by-step -step instructions of how to run your jobs, how to restart something, how to fix something that's broken, how to correct, da uh, correct data that might have gone wrong with pictures. I'm talking if somebody calls you and says something stopped or something's broken and you're driving in your car, you can say, or you know, you're somewhere else you can't really get to, to a computer, you can say, grab the book off of my shelf, go to this section, I want you to pull up that job and do A, B, C, and D. Call me back, and I can help you if you run into any problems. You want to be able to go on vacations and have somebody be able to look at this book first and then call you. It's actually giving you some time um, back than having to be in the office. You've kind of given somebody a roadmap to fix something that might not be as important of you having to do it um, yourself. And it kind of gives you a little breathing room. Very important. And again, paper copy. Because then you don't have to give them directions on where to find it online, if it has the latest copy, if it's a link, so link to this place so they can't get to it or whatever. They actually have a paper copy that they can go and write notes on. And then next time they go to do that same step, they said, oh, I remember this last time I wrote a note. And then they're able to help you more and more. It's important. Some people say, you know, knowledge is key. And you don't want to share that knowledge. I say that's bull. Um, the more knowledge you put out there and the more documentation you have, the easier it is for you to leave that job when you want to. Not only that, it allows you to be promoted. So many people get stuck in a job because they are the best at it. They know everything. They built everything. And therefore, they're passed over for promotions because they're too important where they are. Don't build job security because you cannot move up when you put yourself in a situation where you're the only person that knows. So document, monkey instructions. Monica. Again, documenting your code. This to me is not only documenting for everybody else who reads your code, this is about leaving myself breadcrumbs. When I'm doing, you know, 80 things in a week, and I'm not lying, I might be touching 80 things in a week, I don't know what I did Monday by the time it's Friday. So I make sure all of my code actually has, you know, what it's used for, you know, what's calling it. Is there a job associated with it? So I've left myself a breadcrumb to look, go look at SQL agent. How to run it. I actually put a run statement here with parameters. So all I have to do is highlight it and run it and see some results. Um, I keep track of a help desk ticket or any changes that I've done. Again, I'm doing this for me so I can go back and figure out what I did and why I did um, what I did. So hopefully everybody's got some kind of preamble like this um, in their code. And they, um, you're keeping up with it. Avoid customizations. Monica, yes. I, I do have a question or a committee oh. comment. Um, this kind of carries over from the last one we did. So my point is, why manage it in this way when there's always a better job with better management and there's more people to do the job? How do you find the motivation to keep up with it instead of taking the easy way out looking for another job? I'm going to go over that. That's one of my last slides, why I love it and why I wouldn't have had it any other way. So I'm going to hold off on that question because okay. um, I'll be answering that shortly. Okay, thanks. Okay, 
So avoiding customizations. All of us want to be able to write some really say, hey, I wrote this. This is pretty cool. It can do this and it can do that and have the impress factor. Problem is, as a lone DBA or working in a small group, you have so much to do. Why and reinvent, reinvent the wheel? There are some really great um, community-based tools out here that people use and swear by every day. If you're not familiar with Glenberry scripts for performance, I highly recommend them. They're a really great set of scripts that you can go and run and run all kinds of health checks on your server. Find out a bunch of stats on the DMVs um, that you can use to analyze your server um, that he's already written. So you don't have to worry about the joins or the where clauses or anything. He has them. Use them. Um, hopefully all of you guys are using Ola's index scripts. Why are you writing your own index maintenance scripts when there's already scripts out there to use? Be efficient in your work. Use what's out there already. There's health check things out there. Um, people have written things and we all use them. Um, they've been vetted. Don't make your own tools. Use what's out there. Research. Um, and then ask questions. You can always ask people what do they use so you don't have to take time building it. Don't bake your own monitoring tools. And speaking of tools, um, you have to be an octopus. You have to have eight arms, right, to get everything done. How are you able to do it? Um, the only way I've found as a lone DBA is through tools. When I'm monitoring 56 servers, I can't babysit them all the time. I can't be running queries. I can't bake my own tools. Um, I really, really, really like using tools to keep an eye on my servers. It lets me be proactive, and it lets them do the work for me to where it can kick me actionable alerts. So these are ones that I've used. Um, I grew up on Idera Diagnostic Manager. I currently use Century One. Um, you mentioned Redgate uh, SQL Monitor. Um, admin work. We got, you need to clone something. You need to check backup status. You need to um, do some partitioning. Idera's admin tool set is a great thing for that. Um, you need to compare two stored procedures. You know, it could be line by line. Luckily, they have a, a Redgate has a tool belt, SQL Compare, that will actually go through and uh, compare two store procedures or two databases. I um, mean, you can see what the difference is. Uh, SQL Doctor is a great little health check uh, tool that Idea has. All of these are time-saving things that can help you. They act as your extra arms. They act as extra employees for the company. And it costs half the, half the money if, if they hired somebody. So it's one thing you can talk to them and say, hey, by doing this, I'm able to handle the workload. Give me these tools. Um, to help me do so. So check them out. Um, again, this is Idera, this is admin tool set. Look at everything you can do. You can SQL discover and find all of the SQL servers lurking in your environment. You can copy logins. You can re-index stuff. You can look at statistics, um, do connections checks. All of this that you would normally have to write code for by push of a button. It's all about being efficient with your time. This virtual database is fantastic. When you have an environment that has large database backups and you need to restore to get a single table back or a single store procedure back, um, this allows you to actually do queries or restores um, object level from a BAK file without restoring the BAK. So it's all about you know, using the tools to time save. Um, and here again is SQL Doctor that kind of gives you health checks and current things that you can um, look at with your servers. It will actually give you the correction script to do uh, to fix the issue, and it will give you the undo script to undo that correction if it doesn't work in your environment. Again, it's all about researching and not exactly trusting the tool 100% and knowing what you need to do, but it really gives you a great guide. Um, here's I Century have a One. Of questions, if you want to take them. Um, give me two seconds. Let me finish these tools, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. Um, so here's uh, the Performance Advisor, which I absolutely love from Century One. Um, they have Plan Explorer, which um, I can go through and look at uh, my execution plans on steroids. It's all built in within the tool. And one of the greatest things they have is this job chaining. All of us have a morning job chain of things that need to run for reports or data that needs to be copied over, things like that. And I would wake up in the morning, and if a job failed, I'd have to go back and find out you know, what needs to be run next and what needed this data and what needed that data that was all contingent. They actually have a chain to where I could chain all of my jobs together, and if something failed, I could restart the whole rest of the chain after I fixed the failure. Or it would automatically kick off if a job ran long, the next job wouldn't run until after. So it really kind of saved me time in the morning 
um, of having to deal with uh, had this one finished versus that one finished when I had a when I had a failure. Um, Redgate tools again. It's all about working efficiently. I love SQL Prompt. SQL Prompt really makes my code look good. I'm a sloppy coder, so I can go and clean my code. It helps me with my joins. Um, if you're getting, uh, you inherit somebody else's code and it's hard to read, you could go and reformat all the code um, with a click of a button and it'll make it very, it, it's a time-saving thing. Um, again, SQL Compare, they have source control. Different tools you can do to make yourself more efficient. Um, and if you have no budget, there are free tools. If you're not using these free tools, you should be. They're out there. Search for them. Century One's Plan Explorer now is in the pro version for free. It is your query execution plans on steroids. It's going to help you faster uh, resolve your issues and identify bottlenecks. Um, it even has a button at the top where you can actually obfuscate your um, execution plan and send it up to Century One, and they'll analyze it. They have people analyzing them and help you figure out what your issues are. These are free. Redgate SQL Search will search through all of your code for um, objects or names or anything that you're actually uh, field names, things like that, uh, for free. That's time savers. Um, we have first aid kits available, and of course, um, you know, SP Who's Active. I don't know anybody who's not using that. Again, these are free tools that you should be taking advantage of. Okay, Kathy, you want to go ahead and give me your question? Okay. Um, one of them wants to, I think it's the uh, first screen, wants to see the preamble again at the end. And then um, there's the preamble. I actually have a blog post on this. If you go to my ah. site, sqlespresso.com, I have one about preambles, um, and it actually gives you this. So you can steal it from there. Okay, I didn't really realize that's what was meant by preamble. Okay, uh, one of them is a comment. I got chewed out by one of the contractors that manages our server for running a script uh, I found online. Now I'm kind of gun shy, and it was a, a Kevin Klein script, so he was kind of confident it was a good script. So do you have anything to say about that? Test, test, test. Hmm. Always run the scripts in test first. Never just take something and run it in production. Um, finding one online is great. We put it out there for a reason. Um, but you've got to know what you're running, be able to understand what it's returning and what is actually the implications to your system. Again, don't blindly trust Google or all the scripts out there. You need to actually pull down the script and understand it before implementing it into your environment. I think that's one of the things that people have a downfall with. They go and grab it. They read a blog or something like that and say, oh, this is what I need to run, and they just run it. Mm -hmm. And then they just go with the results. It's all about understanding and communicating and being able to know what it's doing to your system. True. And the other one, I think I know the answer to this one. Do you need admin rights on your system to install these tools? Depends on the tools. But, Kathy, you work for Redgate. I'll give you that answer. I'll let you I, would, answer that. I would say yes. I would say most of the time it's going to be yes. You're going to need admin rights. Well, again, you're not going to go and install tools on your production environment or in your environment without consulting somebody first, I hope. Right. I hope you're talking to your boss about it, or I hope you're talking maybe uh, coordinating with your network admin and saying, hey, I want to use this tool, um, and kind of keeping them part of the process. Right. I think that is it. Um, wait, okay. Wait a minute. Now, I keep finding more questions. Um, one of them, uh, they don't have a test environment. Um, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> So, it's so a, okay, it's so there's two things. One, everybody has a test environment. It's called your laptop. Okay? So I didn't have a real test environment um, in on the main servers anywhere. But anyone can install SQL Server Development Edition on their laptop if you can get permissions and make that a test environment. You know, you can do things like that um, to help. If not, Maybe you have a test database that you can connect something to rather than a production database. I've been in that, that realm too. You know, I might not be, I might have to actually run it on my production server, but I'm running it against a test database. So I'm, you know, hopefully having less impact there. Okay. And one more comment. Uh, I think this might be from one of your coworkers, actually. <laughs> if you are a DBA, you need admin rights. Fight for that. 
if you aren't the DBA. If you are, if you are a DBA. Yes, this is true. <laughs> okay. If you are a DBA, you should have admin rights on your servers. Right. For sure. Um, but if you're talking about uh, not rights, you know, admin rights on your laptop or something like that, it could be company policy. I, I agree. You still should be fighting for it. Oh, Joey says workstation. Hmm. So, so really, if you're talking about installing tools, um, I would say if I have a if I have a system and I want to install who is active. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I don't think you know that just anyone should be able to go out and do that. It, you know, or if I want to start monitoring with SQL Monitor, not everybody should be able to just go out and do that. So I I agree. Um, everybody's <laughs> environment's different, and everybody's uh, lockdown rules are different based on what kind of. Um, uh, field they're in. So some are locked down more than others. However, as the DBA, you have a certain amount of trust that should be instilled in you. Right. It's part of doing your job. Um, to me, I've never run into that issue. I've always been granted um, admin access, and if not, I would have been fighting for it for sure. Right. Because um, you've got to be able to do your job. Right. As, yeah, as a DBA, you're definitely going to have more rights than, uh, you know, a developer per se right. on the system. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, so to answer the question from before, see it's not so bad. So why do I love being a lone DBA? One, I get to make the rules. I am never in a meeting arguing with somebody on how to do my SQL Server. I'm doing it the way I want to do it. And since I'm a type A type person, I love this. I want to be able to know to make up the naming conventions. I want to be able to decide how I'm going to configure it. I make the rules when it comes to SQL Server. I am the in-house go-to SQL authority. There is nothing going on with these SQL servers without me knowing about it. That's pretty powerful stuff. When you're in a business meeting and they're talking about storage and the new ways they're going to do disaster recovery and everybody looks at you for the answers on what we need to do with SQL Server, that's pretty darn cool. You know, that's something I like. I don't like to actually be in a you know round table meeting discussing for an hour what naming convention we're going to do or what view we're going to decide to do or what you know what configuration we're going to implement i am the deci decision maker and the go to authority um, you get to do so many different things in your day and career you are not pigeonholed into just doing bi you are not pigeonholed just doing into the backups and setting up servers and things like that I have a facets and facets of things I've gotten to touch and do with SQL Server um, that many that have not have not gotten able have not been able to do because they are doing a particular piece of the SQL Server puzzle. Um, so that's really great. You're never bored. I am always busy. I am always busy. And if I want to slow down that busyness, I have the power to do so. If I want to speed it up, I have the power to do so. Um, I'm never bored. I'm never sitting there trying to find work, um, which I know a lot of people are, are getting into that realm sometimes where they don't have anything to do and they're waiting for a problem to arise. Um, I have my flexible schedule. I am able to take my girls to dance. I am allowed to take more vacation days than anybody else. They're not really vacation days because I'm working or I'm available, but I have more you know, days on the books that I'm able to get out of the office if I want to. Um, still, again, being available because it's 24-7 but I'm more flexible. Um, I'm constantly learning new things. Somebody needs to do a new way to encrypt something or they want something to do. Well, I've never touched encryption before, so I'm gonna go off and learn it and then implement it. So I, I get to actually play with the latest and greatest of SQL Server sometimes. Um, I'm learning new things, which is the point. Um, you become very marketable. I put my resume out there probably five years ago. To this day, I am still getting calls constantly on the same resume. Why? Because the computers pick up every freaking keyword possible for SQL Server because it's sitting on my resume. Um, because I've touched it and I've been able to do it. Um, it's not one thing where I'm just a report writer or I'm just a DBA. You're able to say I SQL Server, all of it, and you know, for me a little bit of Oracle, um, but it picks it up. You become very marketable. So um, being a low DBA, even if you're doing that for a short amount of time, it really does add to your personal value and your marketability. So homework. 
Okay, this is the fun part. And again, I do get giddy and people laugh at me when people actually do the homework. Um, I want you to get a Twitter account if you don't already have it. Twitter is so important in the SQL family community out there. It's so great and helpful that you should really be taking advantage of this. Get a Twitter account. Um, follow me at SQL Espresso, and you'll look, and I have a list. It's called SQL Gurus. Of course, getting new to Twitter, you don't know who to follow or what to do, so I give you a list. You click on that list and follow everybody in that list. It'll get you started. It's got some top names in the SQL Server community. It's got some, you know, maybe some just really friendly names in there. There's a lot of people out there that can help you. Start from there. And then what I want you to do is I want you to tweet me. I want you to say, hey, SQL Espresso, I attended your virtual um, WIT session. Um, I just want to say hi. And then I will take it upon myself to go out there and introduce you to the rest of the community and say hi to everybody else and kind of get your name out there. Um, every morning I am on Twitter. I get out and say, good morning, tweet, uh, Tweets. How's it going? I'm doing this today or that today or give some kind of inspirational thing. Start getting out there and becoming visual. Jump into conversations. Nobody's going to get upset with you if you're going to jump into a conversation. If you have some experience in something, put that experience out there. Share it. Um, follow the SQL help hashtag. Um, go out there and start looking at the questions people are asking. Maybe you've experienced that and you can answer a question. Um, that's what this community is all about and Twitter. It is, uh, it's an amazing tool, especially as a lone DBA or building your career inside the SQL Server realm. It, it makes a huge difference. It's how people get jobs. Um, their next job comes to them. They don't go seeking for jobs. It just comes from connections of using social media and using all the networking capabilities that you can have um, from this community whether it's at SQL Saturdays or it's at um, uh, Past Summit or different things like that. Uh, start getting involved in the community. It will really, really make a difference in your career and getting things done with work. Um, use some SQL tools. Get some free tools. Um, talk to your boss. Download them. Uh, start building those extra arms. Um, get those go-to experts um, and document. Make that hit-by-the-bus handbook. If you ever want to leave that company, don't get stuck like me working for them for two years just to keep them afloat, um, working two jobs. It was great. I won't lie. I put in a pool in my house because of it. Um, but uh, it, it, it's too much. Don't put yourself in that kind of thing. Document it. Turn over that knowledge. Um, and again, network, network, network. Um, talk to people. If you go to your user groups, don't just sit there. Um, talk to the person next to you. Start talking about what they did. That's how you actually meet those people like I have that I have in my hangouts every day that I'm able to ask questions to. It's all about talking. We all have something in common. It's SQL Server. So use us all. Um, and thank you uh, for everybody for coming. Again, Twitter, SQL Espresso. Feel free to email me. I have a blog out there that I update every week. Um, and then actually you can find uh, Denny Cherry and Associates um, doing a security webcast this week, um, Friday, if you want to learn more about uh, SQL security and the, the most recent things that have gone on. Um, we're doing that, and I will be involved as well. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, any other questions? Um, let's see. Uh, well, actually, there was one about um, if you're the first DBA, but the other teams don't include you in meetings, so you don't really know what's going on, things that you're actually responsible for. That's when you bring out your top A and you get yourself or your type A, and you get yourself involved in those meetings. You have to be proactive as a lone DBA or being um, least senior um, as part of a group. You need to be passionate and get yourself in there. Have those conversations with your boss or with the other teams and say, hey, I have some valuable input for these regarding SQL Server. I need to be included in these meetings. Or are you upgrading something? I didn't know about this. I should have known about this. It's part of your job. You need to stand up and defend your SQL servers and get your voice heard. The only way you can actually make your environment um, really good and efficient is being involved and trying to put yourself in those situations. If you're not being brought into them automatically, you need to make sure you're showing yourself and getting yourself into those meetings. Okay. Thank you so much, Monica. We'll get the recording out later today. And um, for everybody out there, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay. You're welcome. Bye.